I grew up in San Diego, so I didn't have much experience with snow. I'd always wanted to experience a traditional white Christmas, just like in the movies. So when my boyfriend, Freddie, asked me to go with him to his hometown in Wisconsin, I immediately said yes. I hadn't been dating Freddie for very long, so I wasn't sure if it would last. But I really wanted a memorable Christmas, so I jumped at the chance to join him. We flew there in the middle of December, when I could finally take some time off work. His mom, Kathy, picked us up at the airport. She was a large, friendly woman, the kind of person you'd expect to meet in Wisconsin. She gave me a big hug and made me feel like a member of the family. During the long drive to her house, she asked me all sorts of questions and kept complimenting my looks. She said she was so happy that Freddie had finally fallen in love with someone nice, especially after his last relationship had ended so badly. I didn't know much about Freddie's dating history, but I didn't want to pry. I could tell from his expression that the topic was making him uncomfortable. Once we arrived, Freddie gave me a grand tour of his house and we walked around the snowy yard. Everything seemed perfect, but when we got back inside, Kathy had prepared a huge meal for us. As we ate, she continued asking me more questions about my life and mentioned a big family reunion they were planning for the summer, assuming that I would join them. I didn't have the heart to tell her that Freddie and I weren't as serious as she thought. I liked him a lot, but we weren't even exclusive yet. That night, Kathy showed me to the guest room and told me that it was fine with her if Freddie and I stayed in the same room. However, this was her house, so I preferred to sleep separately. I thought it was the right thing to do, but she seemed almost disappointed when I said it. I didn't go to sleep right away. I was scrolling through my phone when I noticed that Kathy had posted a bunch of photos of me on her Instagram without my permission. I didn't even realize she had taken all those pictures. She added captions like, future daughter-in-law and welcome to the family, which made me really uncomfortable. I promised myself that I would talk to Freddie in the morning. I figured he could handle his mother better than I could. Eventually, I fell asleep, but that didn't last long. I woke up in the middle of the night to noises just outside my window. I tried to tell myself that it was probably just some animal outside, nothing to worry about. But then I heard footsteps just outside my window. I got out of bed too. I took a closer look out of the window which overlooked the snow-covered yard. I didn't notice it at first, but I soon spotted fresh footprints in the snow. Someone had walked towards my window. It had been snowing throughout the night, so the footprints were clearly recent. Panicking, I wondered who could be out there. I moved closer to the glass when suddenly, a woman jumped out of the shadows. She was shivering from the cold and her face looked desperate. Please let me in, she pleaded. I had no idea who this person was, but I couldn't leave her out in the freezing cold. Slowly, I opened the window and asked where she had come from. She didn't give me her name, but mentioned that her boyfriend had left her, and she didn't know where to go, assuming she was a neighbor, without asking for permission. She sat on the bed and wrapped herself in my blankets. It took a while for her to stop shivering. I explained that this wasn't my house and if she wanted to stay the night, I'd have to wake up Kathy and inform her. The woman responded, you don't need to. She and Kathy are very close. I should have argued with her, but the situation was so strange and I was still half asleep. So I sat down next to her and waited for her to warm up. Neither of us said anything for a while until she suddenly looked into my eyes and smiled. Are you Freddie's new girlfriend? She asked. 
I nodded, feeling uncomfortable and unsure of how to respond. How do you know him? I inquired. She didn't answer my question. Instead, she asked, are you too happy? Do you love each other? The bluntness of her questioning finally jolted me awake, making me realize how peculiar this all was. This stranger had crawled through my window started prying into my personal life in a very direct way. I told her that I could call someone to come and pick her up. Her smile instantly vanished, and all at once she glared at me with pure hatred. She said, you don't deserve him. And then she grabbed me by the throat and shoved me onto the bed. Everything happened so fast that I could barely process what was going on. I tried to push her off me, but she refused to let go, repeating, he's mine, he's mine, he's mine. I prayed that Freddy would hear us from the other room and come to my rescue, but he didn't. The woman kept squeezing my throat until I almost blacked out. With my last bit of strength, I managed to punch her in the side of the head, causing her to fall off the bed and I could finally breathe. I watched as she jumped back up. And for a moment, it seemed like she might attack me again. But instead, she screamed obscenities at me and then dove out of the window. Before I knew it, she had disappeared into the darkness outside. As I struggled to catch my breath, my bedroom door creaked open and Kathy walked in. She asked me what had happened, and I told her that a deranged woman had entered and attacked me, all while I was. Talking Freddy walked into the room too. He asked me to describe what the woman looked like. I did my best to describe her, and his expression dropped. That's Lacey, my ex-girlfriend, he said. She must have seen the photos mom took of you. No wonder I never mentioned my ex before. Lacey was a complete psycho. Freddie wrapped me in a hug and reassured me that I was safe now. Kathy watched us from the side of the room, her face full of concern. Then she said something that I'll never forget. You'll always have my son to protect you. It seemed like such a strange thing to say, as if the attack had somehow brought me and Freddie closer together. I'll leave you two alone, she said as she left the room. After she was gone, Freddy kept apologizing for what his ex had tried to do. He vowed that no matter what, he'd watch out for me and take care of me. Even though we were still at his mom's house, Freddy and I got into the same bed together. His arms wrapped around me. I felt warm and protected, and maybe I was starting to have real feelings for him. I was about to drift off to sleep when I noticed something on the floor just below the window. Lacey had accidentally left her phone behind. I got out of bed to grab it, and Freddie asked me what I was doing. I showed him the phone, and he shouted, Don't look at it! He jumped out of bed and tried to grab the phone from my hand, but I wouldn't let him. I didn't understand why he was acting like that. As he tried to take the phone from me, I turned it on and saw that the screen was already open on a text exchange. Freddy yelled, don't read that, but it was too late. I had already seen that the texts were from him. He had messaged Lacey an hour before, telling her to check out his mom's Instagram, egging her on, and basically challenging her to come over and confront me. I can explain, he said, but he didn't need to explain. I knew exactly what he had done. He wanted his psycho ex to come over. He wanted her to scare me, to attack me, just so I could find comfort in his arms. This was all a setup, and it had almost worked. I threw the phone at him and stormed out of the room. He begged me to stay, but I wouldn't listen. I couldn't even look him in the eyes. I used my own phone to call an Uber, and I got out of there as fast as I could. 
I never wanted to see him again, and I never did. I went straight to the airport and back to California. It was the worst, weirdest trip of my life. But hey, at least I got to see some snow. Before we move on to the next story, don't forget to hit that subscribe button. My name is James, and I used to teach English abroad before I got a good job in the States. Last winter, I had some time off, and I decided to go back to Kazakhstan, where I used to work. I wanted to visit some of my old friends and enjoy a snowy December. My ex-co-worker, Bradley, asked me to stay with him in his apartment. I was surprised by the offer because we hadn't left on good terms. I had hooked up with his ex-girlfriend at the time, and he got really mad at me. I thought that I had ruined our relationship forever, but I guess he had gotten over it. So, I flew to Kazakhstan in the beginning of December. During my first week there, I caught up with all my old friends. I went ice skating, shopping, and did karaoke. It was really fun, and honestly, Bradley was a great host. He always cooked for me, and when we went somewhere, he never let me pay. That weekend, Bradley invited me to go hiking in the mountains just outside the city. I'm not a big hiker, but he was pretty insistent. And besides, if I was in Kazakhstan, I might as well enjoy the mountains. I made sure to wear as many layers as possible because it was extremely cold. Right away, I realized that something was off about the trip. Bradley kept insisting that we go off the marked path, saying there was a frozen lake he wanted to show me. He insisted that he knew the way, but I really didn't feel comfortable cutting through such thick, snowy forest. Before I knew it, we were pretty deep in the wilderness, and I had no idea how to get back to the road. Bradley kept walking, though he acted like he knew exactly where he was taking me. The further we got, the colder I became. I enjoyed it at first, but after a while, I was shivering and miserable. At the beginning of our trip, we passed a lot of other hikers, but as soon as we went off the trail, we didn't see anyone for over an hour. I also noticed that Bradley kept glancing at me and then smirking to himself. He looked pretty devious. Where was he taking me? Eventually, I told Bradley that I'd had enough and wanted to turn back. He shrugged and said, okay, as if he didn't care about the frozen lake anymore. He said he needed to take a pit stop and then we could leave. He walked into the woods and I stood there waiting for him to return, but he never did. I waited for five long minutes before I realized he wasn't coming back. This was his plan all along. He wanted to leave me there, lost and alone. This was his big revenge plan, angry and a little scared. I followed his footprints through the snow, but then I lost them. He must have covered up his tracks so I couldn't follow. I fished out my phone to call for help, but nothing happened. There was no reception. That was when panic started to set in. I had two options. I could either climb to the top of the mountain and try to see where the path was, or I could start walking down the mountain and hope to find someone. I didn't have the energy to continue going up, so I started my long walk down the mountain. For the next hour, I kept walking. My feet kept sinking into the thick snow, and my whole body ached from the cold. I tried to find any sign of Bradley, but I couldn't. Eventually, I started screaming for help, but no one could hear me. I don't remember how long I was out there, but it felt like forever. Finally, I reached a familiar creek, and I knew I was going the right way. I followed the frozen stream all the way back to the main road. I waited there, barely able to move, until a car came passing by. They weren't going to stop, so I literally had to stand in the middle of the road and force them to let me in. 
I was so cold I could barely speak. The driver didn't speak much English, so I really struggled to explain that my friend had abandoned me on the mountain. I don't think he truly understood me, but it didn't matter. He drove me back to the city, and I had him drop me off at Bradley's apartment. I didn't know where else to go. And besides, I needed to finally confront him face to face. I used my spare key and let myself in. I was ready to scream at him. He could have killed me. But when I got inside, I could hear him talking to someone on his phone. He was just explaining what he'd done, really laughing about it. What an idiot, Bradley said. I can't believe he followed me all that way. I'm just waiting for him to come back now. He should be here any minute. I think it serves him right for... Hearing him gloat like that made me even angrier. I couldn't let him get away with this. So, instead of approaching him, I quietly left the apartment and went downstairs to the lobby. Then, I called him on my phone and pretended that my connection was bad. He answered right away. Bradley, you have to help me! I screamed into the phone. Where are you? He asked in a fake, worried voice. I'm still where you left me? I pretended to sound terrified, forcing my voice to tremble. My leg's broken, I lied, trying to sound as pitiful as possible. I fell into a ravine when I was looking for you. I'm going to die unless you find me. What? he asked, genuinely concerned. What happened? I couldn't, Bradley. I'm not as smart as you, and now I'm trapped here. I'm so cold I can't feel anything. He took a deep breath and said he was going to call the police to come get me. At that point, I felt like my prank had gone too far. I didn't want to get the police involved in a search for someone who wasn't really missing. So I said, you'd really do that? You tell the police that you left me alone on the mountain? He stopped to think, and as I expected, he didn't want to get the police involved either. I knew Bradley well enough to understand that he wouldn't do anything to make himself look bad. Eventually, he told me to stay where I was, and he'd come get me himself. I can't move, Bradley. Please hurry, I said. I'm coming he shouted into the phone, and then ended the call. I waited in the lobby for him to rush out. As soon as he walked out of the elevator, I'd surprise him and tell him that I knew what he did. It would be hilarious, and he'd finally learn not to mess with me. I pictured the look of relief on his face, but he never came out. He had lied to me on the phone. He was actually going to let me die in the mountains. After 10 minutes of waiting, I took the elevator up to his apartment. I had no idea what I was going to say to him. When I got back inside, his apartment was empty. I looked all around until I found him smoking on the balcony. At least he seemed guilty. His hands were shaking, and he was lost in deep thought. Quietly, I walked up to him and shouted, Hey! I had never seen someone look so scared in my life. He jerked backward and started mumbling. You, you're dead, he stammered. Why did you leave me up there? I asked him. He just kept mumbling. I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. Then he slipped on some ice on the balcony and fell backward over the railing. It happened so fast and I couldn't stop him. One second he was, and the next, he was gone. He fell 12 stories to his death. I'm not sure whether he actually thought I was a ghost out for revenge, or whether it was just a tragic accident. But either way, he was gone. I should have felt guilty over what happened. But deep down, I knew he deserved it. I flew out of Kazakhstan the next day, and I don't think I'll be back. I'm done with cold weather. We were supposed to have a beautiful honeymoon in Aspen, Colorado. My parents' rich friends 
offered us their cabins so we could save money after spending most of what we had on our wedding. Honestly, it was going to be a nicer honeymoon than either Jorge or I had ever dreamed of. It was a beautiful little cabin deep in the Rockies, with not one, but two hot tubs, one outside and one inside. Technically, one was a bathtub, but it had jets. So in my book, it was a hot tub. We planned to hole up there all week. And during the day, we would enjoy what the mountains had to offer. Skiing, tubing, ice skating, and more. It was going to be so romantic. But of course, it had to be derailed. On our way, a heavy snowstorm rolled in. Never had I seen a blizzard this intense. And it was a complete whiteout. We couldn't even see the car in front of us. Jorge was leaning over the steering wheel, squinting his eyes, trying to see the road. Even with our brights on, we couldn't see anything. We had no choice but to pull over and wait for the snow to let up. After 30 minutes, the snow started coming down harder, and we realized there was no way we would make it to the cabin. We needed to find a hotel to stay at. As I started calling around to find a vacancy, I realized we weren't the only ones who needed to stop for the night because of the storm. I'm not super high maintenance, but I have a thing about cockroaches. So I was desperate to find a place that wasn't a rundown motel. Unfortunately, we came to this conclusion much later than most, so we had no choice. The only place we found was a Motel 6 nestled deep in an obscure mountain town. It was about 30 minutes down the road, according to Google Maps, but it took us an hour to get to the hotel. We had to move at a snail's pace so we wouldn't slide off the road. Jorge was relieved when he saw the neon blue Motel 6 sign amidst the white, but I was filled with dread. In my experience, motels like this were always invested and gross lovely way to start our honeymoon. We got our room keys and rushed into the room. The door was so light it felt like reinforced cardboard, not the... To our presence, I was terrified. I texted Jorge to call 911, but we knew it might take a while for them to arrive given the weather. The man outside continued to yell and bang on the door. He seemed erratic and possibly intoxicated. Jorge picked up the phone and called 911 while trying to explain the situation to the operator. They told us to stay on the line and keep the door locked. As Jorge was talking to the operator, I saw the man outside reach into his pocket and pull out something shiny. It looked like a knife. My heart was racing and I whispered to Jorge, he has a knife. He relayed this information to the 911 operator. The man outside was getting more aggressive. He started pounding on the window with the knife handle, making it clear that he intended to break in. Jorge and I huddled together, fearing for our lives. Thankfully, we heard the sound of sirens approaching. The man outside must have heard them too, because he suddenly ran off into the stormy night. We stayed on the line with the 911 operator until the police arrived. When the police got there, they took our statement and searched the area, but couldn't find the man. They advised us to stay in our room with the door locked for the rest of the night. Jorge and I were both shaken by the experience. We didn't get much sleep that night, but we were relieved that the police had come in time prevent a potentially dangerous situation. The next morning, as soon as the storm had cleared, we checked out of the motel and drove to our cabin in Aspen. It may not have been the honeymoon we had initially planned, but it was a lot safer and more comfortable than that motel. As we settled into the cozy cabin, we couldn't help but laugh about the motel ordeal even though it had been terrifying at the time. We both agreed that it would make a great story
to tell our friends and family when we got back home. But for now, we were just grateful to be in a clean, bug-free, and safe environment, ready to enjoy the rest of our honeymoon in peace and tranquility. Same bad luck as our original honeymoon destination. The ordeal at the motel had left us both shaken, but we were determined not to let it ruin our honeymoon completely. As Jorge recovered from his leg injury, we made the most of our time in the cozy cabin in Aspen. We enjoyed the beautiful scenery, the hot tub, which was bug-free and clean, and each other's company. It wasn't the honeymoon we had initially planned, but it was still special in its own way. We made a promise to each other that we would plan a second honeymoon in a warm, tropical destination once Jorge had fully healed. We wanted to create new, happy memories to replace the frightening ones from that motel. Over time, Jorge's leg healed and we were able to enjoy more outdoor activities, such as hiking and exploring the picturesque surroundings. We took long walks in the snow, hand in hand, appreciating the beauty of nature and the resilience of our relationship. Eventually, our stay in Aspen came to an end, and we returned home with a memorable story to tell. While our honeymoon didn't go as planned, and had its fair share of challenges. It brought us closer together and taught us to appreciate the moments we share, no matter where we are. And as for our second honeymoon, we made sure to choose a destination that was free from any curses or bad luck. It turned out to be everything we had hoped for, a tropical paradise where we could relax, explore, and create new cherished memories together. So, in the end, our love prevailed over the unexpected obstacles, and we learned to find joy in the journey, even if it takes a few unexpected turns along the way. Mascara, she was actually quite pretty. I wanted to ask her what had happened, but I didn't want to pry. Mandy seemed to sense my curiosity and offered a small smile. It's just that I was supposed to get married today, she said, her voice trembling slightly. I'm so sorry to hear that, I replied sympathetically. If you don't mind me asking, what happened? She took a deep breath and began to recount her story. She explained that she had been in love with her fiancé for years, and they had planned their dream wedding for months. Everything was perfect until the morning of the wedding when she received a text message from her fiancé, canceling the wedding and ending their relationship. He just texted me, Tom, she said, tears welling up in her eyes. He didn't even have the decency to call or meet me in person. I thought he was the one. I couldn't help but feel a surge of anger on her behalf. It was a cruel way to end a relationship, especially on such an important day. Mandy and I continued to talk, and she shared more about her life and her dreams. She had a passion for art and had always wanted to travel the world. The wedding was supposed to be the start of a new chapter in her life, but now, everything had fallen apart. As we talked, the storm outside grew more intense and the rain began to pour. I realized that I needed to continue my journey to my parents' house, but I didn't want to leave Mandy alone in her vulnerable state. Listen, Mandy, I said. I have to get going because I'm on a long drive to visit my parents, but I don't want to leave you here alone. How about I give you a ride somewhere safe, like a hotel or a friend's place? She looked at me with gratitude in her eyes. Thank you, Tom. I would appreciate that. We finished our meal and I paid the bill. I could see that Mandy was still shaken by what had happened, but she seemed a bit more hopeful. I offered her my arm 
then we walked out of the KFC together, braving the pouring rain. As we drove away in my car, Mandy turned to me and said, you know, sometimes the unexpected kindness of a stranger can make all the difference in the world. I smiled at her and replied, I believe that, Mandy. Sometimes we meet people for a reason, even in the most unlikely of places. And with that, we continued our journey through the storm. Two strangers brought together by chance, offering support and companionship on a rainy day in the middle of nowhere, was trapped in a surreal nightmare, and I needed to find a way out. I couldn't make a run for it with her right beside me, so I had to think on my feet. Desperately, I tried to maintain a facade of calm. I'm sorry, but I can't see him right now. I have to go. I pulled out my car keys as if I intended to leave. She didn't budge, but she also didn't stop me. I slowly backed away, maintaining eye contact, and then made a sudden move as if to bolt towards my car. She hesitated for just a moment, which was all I needed. I sprinted to my car, jumped in, and locked the doors. I could see her approaching in my rear view mirror, but I started the engine and sped away from the KFC as fast as I could. My heart was pounding, and I kept glancing in my rear view mirror to make sure she wasn't following me. The storm outside was still raging, but I didn't care. I needed to put as much distance between myself and that horrifying encounter as possible. As I drove, I dialed 911 and reported what I had just experienced at the KFC. The dispatcher assured me that they would send an officer to investigate. I didn't stop until I reached a well-lit gas station further down the road. I parked my car and waited for the police to arrive. When they did, I gave them a detailed description of the woman and told them about the gruesome scene she had described outside the KFC. The police assured me that they would investigate and I provided my contact information in case they needed further information. Shaken and relieved to be away from that disturbing encounter, I continued my journey to my parents' house. I couldn't get the image of the woman's smeared wedding dress and the damaged limo out of my mind. It was a chilling experience I would never forget. But in the end, I made it safely to my parents' house where I could finally relax and put that unsettling encounter behind me. It was a stark reminder that sometimes reality can be far stranger and scarier than anything we might encounter in our worst nightmares. It was faster. She lunged at me, trying to reach the steering wheel and prevent me from driving away. Panic surged through me as I grappled with her in the confined space of the car. With a burst of adrenaline, I managed to slam the car door shut, trapping her arm inside. She let out a scream of pain. Her bloodshot eyes locked onto mine. I quickly started the engine, shifted into gear, and sped away from the KFC, leaving her behind. As I drove, my heart was still racing, and I couldn't believe the surreal and terrifying encounter I had just escaped. I needed to put as much distance as possible between myself and that deranged woman. I didn't stop until I reached the nearest police station where I could safely report the incident. I told the officers everything I could remember about the woman and the damaged limo. They assured me they would investigate and I provided my contact information in case they needed further information. Afterward, I continued my journey to my parents' house, my hands trembling on the steering wheel. It was a horrifying experience that reminded me how unpredictable and dangerous encounters with strangers can be. But in the end, I arrived at my parents' house safely, grateful 
to have escaped the clutches of that disturbed woman. It was a chilling reminder of the darkness that can lurk in unexpected places. And I couldn't shake the feeling of unease that lingered long after the encounter was over. I nodded and followed the old lady back into the KFC. The shock of the recent events had left me feeling disoriented and shaken. We both sat down at one of the booths, and the old lady reached for her phone to dial 911. While she spoke with the dispatcher, I couldn't help but glance at the lifeless body of the bride lying on the pavement just outside the restaurant. The reality of the situation sank in, and I realized how close I had come to a tragic and gruesome fate. The police arrived shortly after the call, and the old lady and I provided our statements about the bizarre and violent encounter. They examined the scene, including the damaged limo, and it became clear that this was a complex and disturbing situation. After a lengthy investigation, it was revealed that the bride, Mandy, had a history of mental health issues and had been on the run after a violent incident at her previous wedding. It appeared that she had been targeting James for her vengeance, believing he had wronged her. The old lady, whose name turned out to be Martha, was just an employee at the KFC who had witnessed the confrontation and intervened to save me. Her shotgun had been kept in the restaurant for security purposes, and she had used it to protect me from Mandy's attack. As for James, he had managed to escape from Mandy after the initial confrontation, and he had already contacted the police to report the incident with her. In the end, it was a bizarre and harrowing experience that left me with a deep appreciation for the kindness of strangers like Martha. I couldn't help but wonder about the twists of fate that had brought us all together on that fateful day at a remote KFC in the middle of nowhere. I eventually continued my journey to my parents' house, but the memory of that encounter would stay with me for a long time. It was a stark reminder of how unpredictable and dangerous life can be. And I couldn't help but feel grateful for the second chance I had been given. In the end, that unexpected stop at a remote KFC turned out to be a life-altering experience. It was a reminder that life can take unexpected and dangerous turns, but it also highlighted the kindness and bravery of people like Martha, who intervened to save me from a potentially tragic fate. As I continued my journey, I couldn't help but reflect on the fragility of life and the importance of being grateful for the second chances we are given. That day, I not only escaped a perilous situation, but also gained a newfound appreciation for the value of compassion unexpected heroes that can emerge in the most unlikely of places.